OCD can really tear down someone's identity or sense of identity. Am I a good person or a bad person? You know, if I don't do this compulsion, bad things might happen to other people. And so I think self-compassion really allows us to get to a place where there is a sense of kindness to how much those disorders are aggressively attacking us. I talk about self-compassion more as the act of doing what is best for the future you. I call it like an inner bestie. It's the person is acting in a way in which you're honoring the long-term benefit and wellness of your own self. Beating yourself act up and self using self-punishment actually increases anxiety. And you don't want that. Well, I hope people don't take this episode as like, oh my gosh, now I have another thing I have to do perfectly. I have to do self-care perfectly and I have to do compassion now. Like, self-compassion is also making space for this to be a little messy. Welcome once again to another episode of the Get to Know OCD podcast. My name is Patrick McGrath. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer for NoCD. NoCD is a platform for the treatment of OCD and related conditions. If you're looking for help for OCD or related conditions, check us out at NoCD.com. And if you like the Get to Know OCD podcast, subscribe to the NoCD YouTube channel. Today, I am joined by Kim Quinlan. Hi, Kim. Good to see you again. You too. It has been too long. I, I hope you are doing well these days. Thank you. You too. Kim, we've known each other for many, many years through the community and everything. But um, for those who may not be familiar with you, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are? Sure. So my name is Kimberly Quinlan. I am an American Australian or an Australian American. I live in Los Angeles. I have a private practice in Los Angeles where we specialize in OCD and OCD related disorder. Um, I also have an online platform called CBT School where I teach um, both clinicians and sufferers how to use different skills. A lot of it is very mindfulness and self-compassion based to augment um, and really complement their treatment. What got you into even being a therapist in the first place, Kim? Um, I, well, there's many ways I can answer that. The first easy way is I was a personal trainer. Um, which is really just code for I was a therapist. <laughs> and I liked hearing people's problems more than I enjoyed doing the physical training work. Um, so that is one answer. The other answer is I was also in recovery myself or in the early stages of recovery of an eating disorder myself. Um, and being in the field of being a personal trainer was not going to allow me to recover long term. Um, and so I decided this would be another career I could take on that would not only benefit my recovery, but I felt like it was something that was sort of a calling. So that's the direction I went in. And what led that direction to obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety treatment? Well, interestingly, I had never once met someone with OCD until I got my internship, no one in my master's degree even talked that much about OCD. Um, even I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. No one really talked about that much either, except for like maybe a couple chapters in one book. Um, I really wanted to work on uh, treating anxiety because I really felt that was the work I was most interested in. And I just happened to find an internship at an OCD center here in Los Angeles. Um, and it blew my mind. I loved it. It was so fun. I loved the specific use of ERP. It was so in line with my work as um, in having an eating disorder. And um, I, I don't know, it just, I love the people. I love the way it works. I love that it's playful. I love that it's active and very direct. Like, we've got a goal. Let's meet it. So that's why I fell in love with the work. That's awesome. Do you find now that working with people with anxiety disorders can kind of mimic some of the work you also did with eating disorder work as well, too? 
100%. I always, um, I never actually felt like I really belonged in the eating disorder crowd. Um, I'm not sure why. I always, especially once I learned about OCD and I got really the a really good training in it, I always felt my eating disorder looked and felt more like OCD than it did a lot of the symptoms I saw other people with eating disorders. Not to say that I had, you know, I so clearly had an eating disorder and um, we can talk about that if needed, but as soon as I understood the cycle of OCD and how it plays out, I would be like, that's exactly what I was doing. Like, that's exactly how it worked for me. And I would have this obsession and I couldn't handle the uncertainty and I felt like I couldn't tolerate it. And so we would do all these compulsions, compulsive exercise, compulsive counting, you know, um, planning schedules, looking at menus, avoiding, like I was doing all of these, what, what for OCD folks was called a compulsion. I was like, this is, this is exactly how it was for me. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's been interesting discussions that I've even seen too, where is our eating disorder some very specific OCD about food, you know, and where on the continuum do a lot of those things go? So it's always a fascinating discussion, I think. And I remember being at the hospital, we always had a cross track group where we do an anxiety group every day, and and the largest cross tracking group with us was always from the eating disorder program, who were coming over working on perfectionism, anxiety, and those types of things as well. Yeah. Well, and and the research shows that people with eating disorders have a high incidence of having OCD. People with OCD right. don't technically have a high incidence, as high an incidence of having an eating disorder. Um, but for in the, in the eating disorder field, there is a massive overlap. A lot of people have either they qualify for a diagnosis of OCD or they have a significant degree of the symptoms um, outside of their regular eating disorder behaviors. So that's, that's, we've got research to back that. Some of the work you've done recently has really been around self-compassion and you've published a book about it. And our mutual friend, John Grayson said he loves it, although there are way too many exclamation points in it. He he notes every time he talks about it. <laughs> I've told but, him I would have added more if the Villablishes had <laughs> I'm wondering if you could tell people about this idea of bringing self-compassion into the therapeutic experience. Yeah. Um I was really lucky in my eating disorder treatment that it was just not, it, we never named it self-compassion, but it was such naturally a part of the recovery. Um, it really was. Um, I don't think I actually would have recovered if my therapist then hadn't also introduced. So yes, we were doing exposures, a lot of exposures to food and a lot of response prevention to food, although we were not calling it that. Um there was a lot of um, accompanied compassion work and kindness work. Um, and as I was recovering and as I was an intern, um, no one was really talking about self-compassion. That was like 14 years ago. It wasn't as, as big of a topic that we would talk about. And my, I would ask my supervisor, like, can I bring this into the room? And he was like, yeah, go for it. And I was sort of really just experimenting, not that I'm claiming that I'm the first one to do this either, but I was experimenting and I did see particularly the folks who have um, really more taboo obsessions, they were just beating themselves up. Like it was getting in the way of recovery. They were not doing their exposures. They weren't doing response prevention. They were just beating themselves up. And that was the focus of what they were doing. And so I was playing with these ideas. Um, and they were working, they were helping. Um, and we were kind of a little bit of a breakthrough for several of these clients in terms of like, oh, we can get to the actual work now that you're not beating yourself up. So that was a big part of why I wanted to write that specific book. Um, the publishers were not actually wanting that. And that's what I was like, well, I'm actually, I won't write a book unless it's about this for basically. And so that's what we did. Good for you. Bully your way through. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it works good. And it's interesting, you know, 
threading into what we've talked about already, that you saw a lot of that with the eating disorder work. You saw how it could apply to OCD. To me, that's a another link of kind of the commonalities potentially between eating disorders and, and OCD. So I'm wondering what else from treatment perspectives or or from lived experience, you've also noticed that they kind of share with each other. Yeah, I, even now, I mean, I wish I could rewrite the book now because I'm, there's so much more I would have added. But the more I think about it, I think it's really more, the compassion seems to be so important when the particular focus of the fear is around an identity-based thing. Like for me, sure. having an eating disorder in my mind, in my eating disordered mind, being fat meant I was a bad person or I was unlovable or unworthy. I don't believe that now. That was all my eating disorder. But it was my identity was being attacked based on how my weight and my body shape was. I think that's true of eating of um, OCD as well is OCD can really tear down someone's identity or sense of identity. Am I a good person or a bad person? Um, I could... You know, if I don't do this compulsion, bad things might happen to other people, making them feel like their whole identity is on, you know, on the plank um, or on the line. And so I think self-compassion really allows us to get to a place where there is a sense of kindness to how much those disorders are aggressively attacking us. Whereas in the seasons of my life where I've had generalized anxiety, the the fear isn't attacking me it's attacking like what would happen if my job i lost my job or i got you know other things it's like my identity wasn't being attacked so it has been very helpful i find it to be additionally helpful for everyone but specifically those where your sense of self and your identity get you know really attacked that's interesting in the sense of you know ocd making you doubt yourself Right. I mean, at, at, at its core, it is the doubting disorder. And so all the doubt that you have about yourself and what ifs that you ask on a constant basis, what if you were to do this or become this, or what if you did this and you don't know this? And I now that you say that, I can see that with some eating disorders as well, too. What if I become the thing I don't want to be or the weight I don't want to be at or eat the food that I don't want to eat or something as well. So there's a lot of potential correlates between those two things. Yep. And depression, because depression's the same. It's it's attacking who you are. It's attacking your worth. It's attacking your value. It's attacking your potential and your future. Like self-compassion is very, very helpful for depression as well for that reason. I think another thing I would say, and this is more, is I think self-compassion also is very helpful for those particular disorders where the suffering levels are very, very high. Like we can all agree that having OCD sucks. Like it's so painful. Um, when your brain at is attacking and you're anxious and you're panicked and you're at a 10 out of 10 all the time, they're the folks who need it the most. Um, and, and that's why I think it can be so beneficial because their level of suffering is just tremendous. So if you were to give a uh, CBT school definition of self-compassion, look at like how I wove those two things together there. That was pretty good. <laughs> if, you, if, if you were to do that, how would you define self-compassion and how do you try to work on teaching that? Or, or at least even if you don't have to teach, getting people to recognize how to do it. Because I'd like to think we all have some innate ability to do that, but it doesn't mean that we do it, even if no. there's the ability to do it. Yeah. No, no. So there are multiple ways we can explain self-compassion. Number one is it's really just the deep wish for wellness and ease, right? It, it comes from, there's a lot of self-compassion woven into different religions, spiritualities, not one particular. I mean, Buddhism talks a lot about it, but it's also woven into many different religions and and ideologies and cultures and so forth um the deep wish to be well and be at ease is a simple way for me my definition of it has evolved over time because i talk about it to the general public a lot um but i'm 
always specifically speaking to my anxious friends, my highly anxious friends. Um, and I talk about self-compassion more as the act of doing what is best for the future you. It's an act of taking care of you. I call it like an inner bestie. It's the person is acting in a way in which you're honoring the long-term benefits and um, and wellness of your own self. And that can sometimes be um, being very gentle and kind and nurturing. And sometimes, particularly for those of us who have mental struggles, can also involve being fierce and taking care of things and going to therapy and facing your fears and saying no to what your OCD is trying to get you to do and what compulsions. So there are these two opposing um, parts of self-compassion that have to be included in order for it to, to work well for people with anxiety. And there are, of course, people who fear, well, if I'm nice to myself or if I'm not beating myself up or putting myself down, then I'll become the thing that I'm afraid of. Right. So maybe the reason I haven't done the OCD feared thing is because of how ruthless and awful and horrible I am to myself. And and if I start to be nice, then maybe I'll actually go do that. How how do you work with people who who have that fear? Sure. So when I was writing the book, um, it was actually during COVID. And um, I did a poll. I, I have a podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit, and I did a poll of my listeners or my students and uh, ended up being almost a thousand people, I think, who weighed in. And that was one of the biggest roadblocks to self-compassion for people with OCD was what if I like snap and lose control because I'm not beating myself up. There was a whole nother group who were like, um, this is how I motivate myself. I'm I yeah. beat myself up and then I stop doing compulsions or I beat myself up and then I get out of bed and I can actually face the day or I beat myself up as a way to morally neutralize the bad thoughts that I've had. Um, there were many specific ways that people with OCD were using self-punishment as a compulsion, um, like very, very clearly using it as a compulsion either to neutralize their obsessions or to protect themselves from losing control. Um, so, you know, we found that out to be really, we found that out really quickly. How I work with my patients with that is, number one, I never insist on anyone stopping beating themselves up. I want to give complete agency to someone to, if that's working for you, you get to, you get to continue it. But before you continue, can we just take a look at how it's working and is it actually working? And in the way in which it is working, let's do a functional analysis of, of how it's working and the pros and cons of that. And when we slow down and we really inquire, we actually then can also consult with some research, which is beating yourself act up and self using self-punishment actually increases anxiety. And you don't want that. Who wants who wants more anxiety? <laughs> like it and we actually know that beating yourself up based on the research that has been proven over and done meta-analysis is that people who beat themselves up are significantly more likely to procrastinate over time than those who use compassion. So yes, it's working to get you to do the hard thing right in the short term, but they end up procrastinating longer over the course. So we can also just look at some research and we're really just there to inquire, is this working? And could there be another alternative? Now, here's the thing. Again, I used to be more of like, roll yourself in love and wrap yourself in the most delicious self-compassion blanket and let's just love on you. And I have over the years learned that that actually doesn't work for everybody. I think most people with anxiety need a good dose of that, but they do also need to stand up to their anxiety. And that too is an act of compassion. It doesn't have to be like, oh, you poor thing. I'm so sorry you're going through this. It can sometimes be like, 
oh my gosh, I'm not doing this anymore. I am. I have been put through the ringer and OCD keeps making me do these stupid things that I only feel bad about doing. I'm going to choose something that's kinder and, and sustainable. So there's many ways in which we can practice it, but I'm never going to take it away from somebody if it's working for them. Yeah. I, it, it reminds me of an example I give, uh, you know, sometimes it's easier to take it out of yourself and think about someone else. So if your kid's in a piano recital, do you say to them, we're so proud of you, we can't wait to hear you play tonight, have a great recital? Or do you say, we've heard you play and what an embarrassment you are to the family. Uh, we won't be attending because we don't want to be associated with anyone knowing we're related. And uh, please sneak out after the end and we'll pick you up in the alley and drive away quickly. Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah. we wouldn't do that to anybody else, but we sure do it to ourselves, don't we? Well, you've just touched on another definition that people have, which is self-compassion is just treating yourself the way you would treat a loved one. Yeah. In that exact situation. Oh, instead, if you had an intrusive thought that you particularly think is horrendous, heinous, how would you treat someone if they came to you and said, this is what I'm dealing with? Chances are you wouldn't be like, you free. You'd be more like, oh my gosh, that is so hard. What resources can we get for you? Let me let me reach out to some friends or a doctor to see what resources we can get you. Um, so self-compassion is that inner bestie, like acting like you would a best friend. Yeah. And never, at least I know for you and me, never, never have either of us gone up to someone and said, you know, I think more compulsions would be helpful to you in this situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And again, self-compassion is, well, self-compassion, but also just being the wisest, most effective version of ourselves, which these are synonymous. Um, they're usually focused on long-term, uh, like benefits and, and effective lice than short-term relief. So it's doing the thing that benefits you in that long-term, right? Which is often yeah. riding waves of uncertainty and discomfort kindly and gently and, and holding space for two opposing truths at the same time, like this is hard and I'm going to face it while also going, and I'm going to be gentle with you and, and making space for, for those two to happen at the same time. Sure. This will not shock you, but OCD can be kind of a jerk sometimes. And so it does like to turn things on its side. Could there become a point where the goal to self-care or have self-compassion become a compulsion for somebody as well? Um, not true compassion, in my opinion, right? Because mm -hmm. remember, self-compassion in its most truest, purest form, which I do not expect perfection any time when people practice this, but in its truest <laughs> form, it, it wants you to feel your feelings, right? Mindfulness, right. which is a huge component of self-compassion, is non-judgment and equal rights for all of the emotions to show up as they do. Um, and we treat them, these emotions, gently as they rise and fall, even the really horrendous, horrible ones, even the, even our OCD, right? There have been times with clients we've even had to be really gentle with OCD instead of yelling at it and telling it it's the worst. Um, can it become a compulsion? This is more about the, the, the myths of self-compassion. So one of the biggest myths of self-compassion is, is that it's letting yourself off the hook, right? Because letting yourself off yeah. the hook can become a compulsion. Yeah. But that's not true self-compassion. Sometimes it is. Like sometimes when we're like, oh my gosh, I have, you know, three more exposures to do on my homework list for the day and I didn't sleep and I've barely eaten today. Yes. Okay, there are days where you don't have to be perfect, but it's compassion is not saying it's fine. Let's just do more compulsions. Um, self care, on the other hand, is um, similar. Sometimes people can overuse it as a way to avoid or reduce their anxiety and discomfort. Right. Um, but then we could also ar argue that's actually not true self care. Um, but again, here is I would go with that. 
I want to bring in some nuance is we are so imperfect. And I, I hope people don't take this episode as like, oh my gosh, now I have another thing I have to do perfectly. I have to do self-care perfectly and I have to do compassion now. Like self-compassion is also making space for this to be a little messy. And, you know, we talk about uh, Kristen Neff, who is a big developer of mindful self-compassion, talks about being a compassionate Neff, which is being gentle with yourself while it looks messy. And recovery for OCD is pretty messy in my experience. There's ups and there's downs. There's days that you do really well. There are days where you don't. And I think a big piece of the work here is even if you're not having a great day, um, you could be moving forward in your recovery by being gentle and not beating yourself up for that. Where does mindfulness come into play in this? I mean, that's been a lot of work in the last decade with treatments and bringing in those types of principles. So uh, what role does it, well, first of all, for people who might not be as familiar, what is it? And then what, what is the role of it in the work that we're doing? Yeah. Um, So mindfulness, in my opinion, and I'm very biased, is this beautiful modality that, that complements the work that we do with OCD. It's in its simplest form. It is the act of being aware of what's currently presently happening in this moment from a place of non-judgment and non-resistance. It's, as simple as that, but it's also a complex practice. Easier said than done is what I really want to say. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but mindfulness is really the act of being more aware of what's going on in this moment. When you have anxiety, you are mostly focused on what could and might happen in the future. And so that's why it's so beneficial in that it is a muscle that we have to strengthen because very few people were blessed with this muscle strong, but it's a muscle where we practice anchoring ourselves in this present moment and being able to observe our experience from a place of non-judgment and, you know, kindness and without resisting it or wishing it would be different or it going away. And there you have a beautiful recipe for ERP. As you rise and, you know, you ride waves of terrible, uncomfortable feelings, you can also practice mindfulness. Um, As a part of self-compassion, it's crucial because often people don't even know they're beating themselves up. It might be 12 or 20 minutes in to saying some pretty gnarly things to themselves before they've even caught that they're doing these behaviors. Um, So mindfulness helps us catch and be aware of ourselves. And boy, if there's anything that's the antithesis to allowing yourself to just feel something, I'd say it's OCD, which only judges you for feeling something and is (laughs) one of the judgiest things in the world. So I can see why it is a struggle for people probably at first to bring mindfulness into treatment because they're so used to looking at everything through this lens of why is this bad and why why am I bad because of this? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it gives us some distance. When you have obsessions, um, you're so zoomed in and so hyper-focused and hyper-vigilant to that fear that you're so zoomed in, you miss things. And mindfulness is the zooming out. It's the taking sort of looking at the bigger picture, right? And sometimes I've had sessions with clients where I'll do a mindfulness activity and they're like intent on trying to solve something in session and they want reassurance from me and they want me to answer that. And then I might do a mindfulness practice and then they'll be like, like, you know, what do you see? What do you, what do you smell? What do you taste? Where are you? What's actually going on? And they'll be like, oh my gosh, it's turned fall and I didn't notice it. Like it's, it, the leaves have changed. How I've been so stuck in this obsession for the last three weeks. I, I didn't, and looking out, I had a client once like cry and be like, I had no idea that the leaves turned. I missed it. Um, yeah. So that's how powerful it can be. You practice this as well too. I, I 
maybe a, a fun shared story of you, but the you did buy a van recently, I believe, uh, for yourself. And I think it's just such a fun story, though, that you really are trying to put this in place for yourself as well, too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for people who don't know, I live in Los Angeles. Um, my whole street is filled with Teslas and Mercedes Benz. Like that's where I, that's, that's life here in Los Angeles. Um, I was really stuck in like, this just doesn't feel like, not that there's anything wrong with that either, by the way. Um, but I, I'm an anxious person too. Let me just disclose. (laughs) And I was really starting to feel like this is, this is all too serious and this is this is a not what life is really about. And I'm not my most mindful in that mindset and in that hustle and bustle. So yes, I made the decision and I bought a 1985 Westphalia Volkswagen van. Her name is Frankie. Uh, Frankie. She's a beast. She's a stick. So it's like also an exposure for me because I have to drive around in LA traffic with a stick shift. Um, but it allows me to just be myself and imperfect and in nature and slow down and take a breath. Plus, it just makes me happy. <laughs> well, and that's great. And, and is it an interesting, I think, when we're doing treatment with people and they have that eye-opening experience, they do see that the leaves are changing colors. They do have a smile. They laugh at a joke. Yeah. And they they even catch themselves doing something and then realize for the last few minutes they haven't been thinking of their obsession, right? Yeah. And I love those moments in therapy when I hear those stories knowing that we're starting to take away some of that control that OC has, OCD has had over people's lives. Yeah. yeah. And to be honest with you, I, I I love that we're talking about this. I've been talking a lot about this on my podcast is one of the biggest ways to walk away from the hyper-focus on anxiety is through doing silly, goofy joyful things not as, and again not as a compulsion but just because it can I think it kind of confuses OCD because if you're like you know what I'm gonna go ride my van around now or I'm gonna jump on a trampoline or I'm gonna do playful things um it does use a different part of the brain and I think it does allow people to zoom out away from this one core obsession or these multiple flip-flopping obsessions that people have um, to actually just prioritizing joy and silliness in their life. If I can get a little personal, you've you've got kids, and they're in this world of you know, there's there's all the social medias and the pressures and different things. How do you how do you bring that into your family's life for people that just have fun and and be goofy and and those types of things? Well, it's funny because, well, number one, I have one of my children is in middle school, so I can't teach her anything anymore. Like I used to be. Okay, well, you are now anxiety. the dumb person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm also the therapist. So if I even sound like a therapist, oh. you know, therapy me, uh, I'm uh, like, I'm yeah. not therapying you. I'm just being your mom. Like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, um, I mean, we used to meditate together. We used to do a lot of this work together. I have to get personal. I have had a few things happen in the last year where I have had a profound humbling in that even though I brought them up with these skills and I taught them self compassion and I did everything I you could hear the desperation. I thought I did everything I could. They still suffer. Now, what the heck? I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought that I had concocted this really great parenting experience. Um, but no, actually, they do still suffer. And I believe it will, these things will 
serve them in the long term. But in the meantime, my mindfulness practice is to let them be on their own journey. And that has been the most humbling, frustrating, letting go. When we're working with people with OCD and we're really involved with families and loved ones and friends who are stuck in the notion that the best way I can help someone is to help them do their compulsions, to give them the reassurance that they want, and to try to make their life as easy as possible. You and I as therapists know that that can be an unfortunate recipe for disaster. How do you get that message across to someone in a way that they will really hear it and understand it and hopefully put it into practice? Yeah, it's a beautiful question because it's so similar to your question about what if people don't, they're like afraid of self-compassion. Yeah. When I'm with a parent, I sit down and I go, tell me why you're doing these compulsions with them. Oh, I don't want them to suffer. It breaks my heart to see them suffer. I don't want them to have to go through pain. I don't want them to be angry at me. I don't want them to miss school. And then again, if we slow down and actually get the paper out and, you know, pen and paper and look at like, okay, is you doing their compulsions with them or for them, is that increasing their suffering or decreasing their suffering long term? You know, will will they look back and think of you as the mom who saved them because you did compulsions or the mom who believed in them that they could tolerate discomfort? And having real conversations about what are the benefits of our behaviors, what are the consequences to our behaviors, being really clear on that so we can make decisions. I've never once had a parent come out of those conversations where they're like, I genuinely think the best thing for them is to keep doing their compulsion. That's the kindest thing to do for my child. I've never once. It's always, always sounds more like, I see your point. This is going to be really hard. But I, I think that the most kindest, genuine parent act I can do is to stop. And I'm going to be gentle with myself and lead by example. And and that could be where we will suggest to parents and friends and families, your own therapy could be very helpful to you in this type of experience if it's that hard for you to be with somebody who is uncomfortable. Well, I personally think every parent needs to have therapy, whether their child has a mental illness or not. <laughs> it's so hard. Like, you deserve help. You deserve support. You deserve time to reflect on what's working and what's not. 1,000% get the support. Um, because even if it's just for you to have a place to vent out how hard it is, um, absolutely get support. I think it will benefit your child in the long term. What other parenting advice do you have for families who are dealing with OCD, especially for some of the younger kids? We've we've talked to some people who OCD showed up in the teenage years, right? But how about for more of the littles on that side of it? What do you what do you suggest for them? <laughs> well, of course, getting support, getting treatment for the child. Like that's always got to be first. See your doctor, you know, make sure you get everyone set up with resources. But in terms of parenting, um, number one, it's you and your child, you know, and against OCD. It's not your child and their, their OCD versus you as a parent. You've got to ally with your kids. Um, gamify it wherever you can and make it fun for you, the parent. How can you, the parent, get involved in a way where you're not feeling like you have to be the therapist, but how can you make it so that we're all invested, the whole family is invested? The, the cases that I've seen that have been so, so successful are where exposures are done with the family. We do it together. We take the stigma out of it by doing it as a family. But as the parent, we all, the, the biggest thing we can do ourselves is to believe in our kids so much that we brainwash them into believing in themselves. That's what I think is so important. 
is to believe in their innate capability as a human being to suffer and come out on the other side. The parents I've seen who really do a lot of compulsions are the ones who believe their kid can't handle it. Yeah. Right? And even if you've, your kid's given you no reason to believe that they can, but remember, we are a human species that have come a long, long way based on doing some really big suffering. So as a human race, they can. You've got to give them an opportunity to suffer um, and you've got to give them an opportunity to learn themselves that they can handle it. And you're there and you're cheering them on like an Olympic mom or dad. Yeah. What other things can parents do or families do to make sure that they get through the therapeutic process in the most efficient manner possible? Um, well, a couple things. I'm a big believer in fam- family therapy. I think that okay. learning how to communicate effectively and kindly and honestly makes the process much, much easier. Uh, but And I think that that's a huge piece in reducing how much these conditions can impact our sense of self. So if someone does a compulsion and their parent goes, John, you're not supposed to be doing the compulsion. Your therapist told you not to, right? Like, not only did the client already know that they're not supposed to be doing the compulsion, but now they feel like a fool and they're starting to see themselves in that way. So I think being able to communicate in a way that helps them and helps them with their own awareness of what they're doing, but doesn't create shame and blame is so important for the person's sense of self. Um, I think that is a huge piece of the work. I've always said that the DSM got it wrong because it limited the definition of OCD to anxiety and distress, and it didn't talk about shame and guilt and disgust and other experiences as well. I'm just wondering your thoughts on that or what you would elaborate on that that OCD brings into the game beyond just what the the diagnostic manual definition of it is. Yeah. Uh, so in when I was writing my book, the publishers were really like, you know, just like publishers, they want it to be like very like fun and say the words. And, and I was really insistent because so many books say, talk about just anxiety and uncertainty. But I, my experience of OCD as a clinician has been that an obsession can be a thought, a feeling, not just anxiety and uncertainty, but other feelings like right. guilt, shame, disgust, a uh, sensation, right? Some people just have a sensation in their finger or a sensation or a grinal response or whatever it might be. So a thought, feeling, sensation, urge, or image. Um, yeah. So yes. It does, you know, definition-wise, OCD does involve things like shame and guilt. I've had clients whose whole obsession is guilt. That is it. They don't have a lot of anxiety. They have guilt, 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 guilt. Um, And that is, again, why that self-compassion model is so important because it gives strategic tactical skills to navigate strong waves of emotion that can be very dysregulating. Right. Sure. If you want to talk about triggering, yes, anxiety and uncertainty are terribly uncomfortable. Shame can be one of the darkest emotions and take you. That's the big correlation with depression. It can just take you into depression to where you don't kind of get out of bed. So I, I think that we need to talk about it more. And I think that a lot of people will get help if they are they learn that it, OCD can target other emotions, too. In your own journey, you've talked about an eating disorder and anxiety. How do you personally practice all of this as you also help on the flip side to get people to be better for themselves as well, too? Yeah. Well, um, number one, I'm not perfect. I have a therapist um, that I see weekly, and I have therapists that I also have who are specialists in areas that I have struggled with, if I do need them, 
um, which is very rarely anymore. But I'm not ashamed to say, like, I'm not ashamed to say I'm putting a call to an eating disorder specialist if I need one. Um, but I'm very, very blessed that I've had, a, you know, nearly 16 years of recovery from my eating disorder. Um, awesome. I, I'm so grateful for that. Um, I am also very, very strict with myself in the kindest way that I do not mess with my disorders. Meaning I know exactly how they show up. I know exactly how they trick me. I know exactly, I'm I'm very mindful in my day-to-day practice to help me catch that. But if it does come in, I am, I'm very proud to say, but not in any way am I bragging. I'm very proud to say I do not mess with them and I, I, I come to play and I come to take it down, meaning Listen. I have strict rules about what I am and I am not allowed to deal. Um, I have strict rules on how I'm allowed to treat myself. Um, and they have those long-term recovery rules that I've was helped to be given from my clinicians have kept me rec- in recovery for a long time. There's people out there watching now. They're debating Should I go to therapy? Should I get help? Maybe I'm unhelpable. What is your advice for those people or those families of a loved one who's struggling? What, how do you, how do you get someone to take the first step? Well, I think first steps look different for every person. First steps might be just making a call and telling somebody. Um, First steps might be you know, admitting yourself into an inpatient facility, right? It depends on where you're at. Um, I think the most important piece here is you can't compare your first step to somebody else's. Um, And a first step worth celebrating is anything that moves you towards um, your recovery, whether that be looking at a no CD article and becoming educated. Um, It might be telling a friend, it might be admitting to yourself that you have the condition. So I'm reluctant to say there's the right first step. I just want people to know that while yes, I love the word unhelpable, it's, we know it's gram from a grammar standpoint, doesn't, isn't real. I really want to say it's also not a real thing, right? right? It's not a real thing. We come from a brain that is highly neuroplastic, which means our brain can change when we change our behaviors. Um, And no brain is the exception to that rule. Tiny, little changes make for, you know, medium-sized changes make for large changes. So it's, it's... just taking that first baby step and being as gentle with yourself as you can as you do it. If people want to find more info on you, where would they go? Um, I am. I have a podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit. Uh, we talk about mindfulness and self-compassion for all um, anxiety disorders, including OCD. Um, you could also get see me on social media at Your Anxiety Toolkit. You can check me out on cbtschool.com or my private practice website is kimberlyquinlan-lmft.com. Awesome. Well, as always, so great to see you again and spend some time with you. And hopefully we'll get to do it in person very soon. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. I want us to do. Well, hey, things happen. Well, once again, everyone, thank you for joining us here on the Get to Know OCD podcast. And my guest, Kimberly Quinlan, thank you for being here with us as well, too. It was a wonderful time with you. And if you're interested in more about what we do at NoCD for the treatment of OCD and related conditions, check us out at NoCD.com. And if you like today's podcast, you can subscribe to the NoCD YouTube channel for more episodes of the Get to Know OCD podcast. We'll see you again in the future. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.